Welcome to another session in the Tech in a Nutshell series by the SNEA Data Storage and Networking Community. Today we'll be talking about RDMA in a nutshell. My name is Michal Calderon. I'm a distinguished engineer at Marvell. Hope you enjoy the session. Imagine a data center running AI training or inference with hundreds of thousands of GPUs that need to communicate with each other quickly and efficiently. Huge amounts of data constantly moving around. To make sure this data moves smoothly, we need a solution that is fast and reliable. And that's where RDMA comes in. Remote data memory access lets servers access each other's memory directly, bypassing the CPU with high bandwidth and low latency. And this session will go into the basics of how RDMA actually works. It's all about moving data. Now let's compare TCP to RDMA. On the left, TCP. Think of an application that has a huge buffer it wants to copy between two servers. With the classic TCP software stack, the application will open a socket, post the buffer, and the operating system will split this data into packets conforming to the TCP transport protocol. Then each of these packets will be delivered to a driver that interacts with a NIC. Now say we want to move one gigabyte of memory with one K size packets. We're talking about one million packets, each processed separately by software running on CPU memory. On the right, we have RDMA, bypasses the CPU and kernel and enables the RNIC, the RDMA NIC, to directly access the system memory using a DMA controller. No need for per packet processing in the kernel. The CPU is still involved in setting up the operation for performing the copy, but once that is done, the RNIC takes over, DMAs the packet into its local memory, and performs the per packet processing entirely in hardware, providing high bandwidth and low latency. Pretty cool, right? So how does this work? We split the RDMA operations into two categories, channel semantics and memory semantics. Channel semantics are similar to the traditional send-receive model, where the sender sends a message to the receiver, the receiver processes this packet, and passes it to the application. In RDMA, the receiver needs to be prepared for an incoming send operation. A buffer is pre-posted. Memory semantics refers to operations that don't involve the receiver. You either read data from the remote memory or write data to a specified location. The CPU and OS on the receiver side won't even know this occurred. In this session, I'll dive into the details of memory semantics and demystify some of this RDMA magic. So before copying some data from one server to another, the CPU performs some operations. It sets up the operation in the RNIC, lets the RNIC know where the memory is locally, where the memory is remotely, and what operation it wants to perform, such as a read or a write. Once this operation is configured, the RNIC can access the memory directly and then packetize it and send it over the wire to the remote setup. All this is done without the CPU involvement. Huge amounts of data can be transferred this way. Now, one important note I want you to keep in mind is that RNICs can also deliver memory directly from GPU memory, bypassing host memory. This is referred to as GPU direct. But due to essence of time for the sake of this session, we'll use system memory for clarity. So what is an RDMA application? Definition-wise, any software that leverages remote direct memory access to perform data transfers between systems. It can use RDMA directly via low-level APIs like the Verbs API, which provides fine-grained control over RDMA operations, or by using higher-level libraries or frameworks that abstract RDMA, such as LibFabric, TensorFlow, NVMe over Fabrics, and more. In this session, I won't talk about higher-level libraries, but even if you don't use RDMA directly, you'll hopefully get a good feel for what's going on under the hood. Now, it's hard to explain how things work without understanding some key objects and terminology. The RDMA application communicates with the RNIC via a software library that provides APIs to create RDMA objects. I'll swiftly talk about the queue pairs and the completion queues and leave more time to dive into details of the memory regions where today's focus is. The QP terminology serves multiple roles. Queue pairs are software objects in the RDMA API. They're used by the application to post requests for RDMA operations. And a software object also encapsulates the state and configuration needed for communication. Applications can have multiple queue pairs. The QP maps to a hardware resource in the RDMA NIC. The RNIC executes the work request posters to the QP and handles the packet generation, parsing, and protocol compliance. A QP also represents a connection between two RDMA endpoints. 
Two examples for this is a QP that is paired with a remote QP, referred to as RC, reliable connection, and a QP that can send to multiple destinations, referred to as UD, unreliable datagram. Completion queues, simply put, are a way for the RNIC to let the RDMA application know when a work request is completed. Similar to QPs, an application can have several CQs. The application can read from the completion queue either in polling mode or request an interrupt to be generated by the RNIC when a new completion arrives. Now our main focus for today's session, the memory regions. Let's dive into how this works. So think of the memory region as a description of memory on host that can be accessed by the RNIC. The memory size can vary from several bytes to tens or hundreds of gigabytes. Once the memory region is registered, the RNIC can read and write from this memory directly. The RNIC will have all the information it needs to be able to DMA the memory directly from the host into its own local memory without any CPU involvement. Once memory is registered, it is pinned to physical memory to ensure access to the RNIC. And once a memory region is registered, a key identifying that memory region is created and later used for all memory operations that are done on that memory region. The RNIC can then translate between a key and a relative or virtual address to the actual physical address of the memory. Note that the memory region can be mapped to physical memory, which does not have to be contiguous. Information about the memory layout, size, address, and anything else required by the RNIC to calculate the address resides in metadata in RNIC accessible memory. The key is simply a number or index into a lookup table. Now, this can vary in implementations, but at the end, it's an identifier of a memory block. Every memory region actually has two keys, the local key, L key, and remote key, R key. When the RNIC receives a request from the host, it will contain an L key which will be used for the key to MR mapping. And when the RNIC receives a request from the wire, it will get the R key from the packet, which will be used for the key to MR mapping. Once you have the MR mapping, the RNIC can calculate the address on the host based on this metadata that is preserved for every MR. The values of the keys, lookup table mappings, and storing of the metadata are implemented differently by different RDMA vendors, but the concept is the same. Let's try putting this terminology into a very high-level overview of what an application would look like. Whether you're writing an RDMA application with low-level interface or using a higher-level framework that leverages RDMA, the next few slides will show you the typical stages of an RDMA application. The host application will start with some initialization, object creation, memory region registration. Then the application will establish a connection with a remote server. Once a connection is established, memory keys will be exchanged between the servers. And then the application is free to start reading and writing with low latency, high bandwidth, and CPU bypass. At the end, there will be some connection disconnect. Now let's just jump straight into the memory key exchange between peers. I mentioned before that we split the RDMA operations into two categories. Until now, I focused on the memory semantics, but to understand how keys are exchanged, I'll quickly explain the channel semantics which are similar to the traditional send-receive model, where the sender sends a message to the receiver, and the receiver processes this packet and passes it to the application. The message will arrive in pre-posted memory buffers on the receiver side, and there will be no R key involved. Receiver will usually get notified that there is incoming data. We assume the application already initialized its objects, such as queue pairs and completion queues. It's already established a connection with a remote peer. It has posted buffers on its receive queue so that it can accept send requests from the peer server. And it has already registered its buffers as memory regions. And now it wants to exchange its R keys. The application will pack the R key into a send operation and deliver the request to the RNIC using a Wookie, a work queue element on the queue pair. This will result on the send operation being delivered on the wire. Once the send operation reaches the other side, the destination side RNIC will process the operation, place it in a pre-posted buffer, and notify the application by writing a cookie, a completion queue entry on the application CQ. The application on each side will then store the R key and use it for RDMA memory operations. Now it's time to post read and write operations. Let's give an example of a write. This is done by posting write wookies towards the RNIC. A write operation from the purple buffer represented by L key to be sent remotely to a destination buffer represented by the orange R key. 
The Arnic will then process the Wookiee, DMA the data into its local memory, packetize it, and send it over just to be placed by the remote Arnic in its final destination. Usually when that's done, a CQE, completion queue entry, will be written to the host application to let it know that it's done, either on the sender side or the receiver side or both, whatever the application requested. Similarly, of course, we can do for the reads. And that's it. Thanks for watching this NIA data storage and networking technology in a nutshell session on RDMA. Hope you enjoyed the session. Get more of our educational content, including white papers, presentation, webinars, blogs, and more at snia.org groups DSN.